So this is this is ah, basically ah, this is your first trimester final. Okay, yeah. now I get it. Yeah. All right. Should we just start from number one? Sounds good. Okay. When I have this function, what is the domain? So isn't the domain all real? No, you can. The domain of that is x has to be greater than zero. It cannot even be zero. You cannot take the log of a negative number, nor can you take the log of a zero number. So therefore, when I have the log of x plus 1, what I do is take whatever's in the parentheses and make it so that it has to be greater than zero. So what's the solution? Um, would it be negative one? Yeah, x would be greater than negative one. And which one is that? B. No, that says greater than or equal to. So it'd be none of these then. Yeah. Hold on. Let me look at this for a second. There's definitely no way that x can be negative 1. Because you cannot take the log of 0. So b is not correct. Um, a is not correct because it's it, b is the answer, but it needs parentheses around both sides. So, yeah, D is the answer. Um, none of those. Do you have answers on these, by chance? Are they at the end of the... What? Do you have answers? I don't think so. Uh, that's fine. We don't need them. Yeah. All right. When you have composite functions, like number two, Okay, so f of x equals x squared, and g of x equals square root of x minus 6. First of all, let's figure out what f of g is, which means f of g of x. So how do you figure this out? What's f of g of x? Well, plug in g of x. Let's go back a step. If I said to you, what is f of 3? What's the answer? Uh, it would be 9. Okay. What's f of 1? One? 1. All right. So you know how to do, in other words, whatever's in the parentheses, you plug in for x. That's the secret. Okay. So when they say f, of g of x, well, let's first of all plug in g of x. So they're really talking about f of x minus 6. Okay, now how are we going to solve that? Uh, just square it so it would just be x minus 6. Yeah, so you're right. That's, and now what's the domain of that? All real numbers? Correct. But when you have a composite function, the domain is always the most restrictive domain of either of the two functions. So let's go back and look at the domain of f of x. What's that? All real. What's the domain of g of x? Uh... Um. 6, 
Is six is greater than x? Well, x is greater than greater than or equal to six. In other words, yes. if you're trying to figure out the domain of that, take whatever is inside the radical and make it greater than or equal to zero, because that's what it has to be. So the domain is greater than or equal to six. And your domain of the composite function is always limited by that. In other words, you have to go back to the most restrictive domain. So, so despite the that. fact that our final function is x minus 6, and there appears to be no domain restrictions on that, we are limited by the domain restrictions on one of the original functions. x has to be greater than or equal to 6 even if you don't see it in the final function? Well, which answer is that? C? Yeah. That's greater than or equal to 6. Where's the vertical asymptote on number 3? Uh x equals 1. Number 4, which is not a solution. Well, in order to answer that, we're going to have to figure out all the solutions. What's the first thing I can do to this thing? Just plug everyone in. No, that's not a bad idea. I kind of like that idea, actually. Zero is a solution, right? Yep. But I want to make sure you know how to do it. So let's figure out what the zeros are of this. What's the first step? Um, take out next. Yeah. And now what's the second step? Uh, factor. So it'd be x plus 3, x plus 2. No, x minus 3, x minus 2. What are the three solutions? 0, 3, and 2. So what answer is not correct? 5. Good. That way is much faster. <laughs> what's that? That way is much faster. Well, I don't know if it is or not, but you should know how to do that way. In, in other words, uh, if this was not a multiple choice question, you'd need to be able to do it this way here. Okay. okay. The fact that it's a multiple choice question and there's three correct solutions, yes, you could do it the other way. And you, you might actually be cur be. Uh, quicker the other way because by the time you get to B you would find out that 5 is not a solution. The problem is is what if 5 was D? Then you'd have to go through three correct solutions before getting to the answer and that might be slower. So which way is faster kind of depends on where the incorrect answer comes. If it's in the first couple, then your way is actually probably faster. I know zero is a solution really quickly. Uh-huh. But, and then the very next thing I would discover would be that five is not a solution, and I'd be done. Now, I'm not positive my way is faster, but you need to be able to do my way, for sure. Okay. Whether it's faster or not. All right, which of the following graphs has been reflected over the x-axis and moved up to? Um, reflected over. Uh, would it be D? Very good. And that's not that easy to figure out. In other words, let's look at A. A is reflected over the x-axis because of the negative sign, but then it's moved down to. 
B has been shifted horizontally left by two spots and then or reflected over the x-axis and then shifted left two spots. So that's not an up or down movement, so that doesn't qualify. C is an absolute value, which always looks like this, which is completely different. So it's not C. And finally, D is correct because it's basically the same as, notice the difference. In other words, I can remove the parentheses and I still have minus x squared cubed which is reflected over the x-axis, and then I have the plus 2. That's a moved up by 2. Sure. How are we going to solve number 6? Uh, this is tough. Um, Long division. The only way to solve it. Uh, I, you, I guess you could solve it synthetically by synthetic division, but if you don't know how to do long division, let's teach you right now. Now, the one thing you have to be careful about whenever you're doing long or synthetic division is that you allow for every degree that's available. Well, notice we're missing an x squared in that. So we have to allow for that by making a 0 x squared. And then plus x minus 7. So that's the first thing you have to do, is you have to make sure that you have um, every degree of x represented. And that is regardless of whether you're talking about the dividend or the divisor. In other words, if I was dividing by x squared plus 6, I would really have to divide by x squared plus 0x plus 6. That would be my divisor. Uh -huh. Okay. So, whenever you're missing a degree, you have to put in what's called a ghost very that 0x squared that I put in as a ghost variable. Now I have an x cubed, an x squared, an x, and a constant, and I can do the division. Okay, what's the first step in this division? First step is um, finding how many times x plus 6 goes in the x cubed. Not really. The first step is to divide that into that. That's it. Okay. Very simple. Just the first term? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. What is the first term? So it would be x squared? Now you multiply that x squared by both terms. So it would be x cubed plus uh, 6x squared. You subtract the two, correct? And you subtract, correct. What do you get? Negative 6x squared. Now bring down the next term. And yeah, and then repeat. So would it be 6x for the next one? Well, the only thing you're doing is dividing x into that whole thing. What do you get? You get negative 6 x. 6x, okay. Now multiply the negative 6x by both terms. Uh, yeah. The next term? Um, negative 36x. Subtract. Uh, you get negative 35x minus 7 for the no, bottom. No, you actually get 35x minus 7. In other words, x minus 
a negative 36x is a, actually it's 37x. Bring down the constant. You see where 1x minus a negative 36x is 37x? Yeah. Okay, repeat again. Um, so for your next term, it would be 37. Yeah, just plus 37. Keep going. Um, and then so then you multiply it through so third and then plus here let me calculate that out. See what's that? I mean that's two twenty two. I believe. Okay. Now subtract again. Uh, you get two. What's negative. minus seven minus two twenty two? Minus two twenty nine. That's your remainder. In other words, once we get down below x, we can no longer divide anymore. So minus 229 is your remainder. I, I guess none of these, but that presumes that I did not make a mistake. Let me just check my math real quick. I think your problem was with the uh, where did I make positive. It? it was with x uh, minus uh, positive x minus thirty six because that would be thirty five. No, positive x. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is thirty five, but it doesn't change the remainder, does it? Well, can't you not subtract a oh, negative from a negative on, either? And then when I divide x into that, I get 35. And then I get 35, and I have to multiply 35 times 6, and I get 210. So my remainder is minus 210. Wow. Hold on. Jeez. I hate it when I make arithmetic mistakes on problems. Let's see. That's minus 6x squared. Bring down the x. And then that goes in minus 6x. And that's minus 36x. And then I have 1x minus a minus 36x. That's 37x. Right? What? When you have 1x minus a minus 36x, what's the answer? 37x. That's what goes there. Bring down the minus 7. Repeat. And you do end up with 37 there. Is that what we got last time, though? It is. That's okay. We have an answer that qualifies. Uh, that's 222. So now I have minus 7 minus a minus 222. Oh, that's where I made my mistake. That's 215. Right? Minus 7 minus a minus 222 is positive 215, and that answer is on there, number A. Oh, correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, what that shows you is a lot. First of all, you not only have to do this problem exactly correct, but, boy, you cannot make one single error in doing your divisions and subtractions and all of that.
otherwise you'll get the wrong answer. And the fact that they put none of these on most every question, that's really tough. Yeah. In other words, if they had a number there, then you'd immediately know you made a mistake and you could go back and correct it. But the fact that they had none of these on there, I might have chosen that as the answer if I was doing it. Because the first time I did it, I got like uh, 222 or something like that. I got an answer that wasn't on there. So I would have been inclined to choose none of these. But the fact is, is that when I rechecked my math, I got 215. And that answer is on there. And mm -hmm. I was suspicious because I didn't really think, well, none of these was the answer on number one. But typically, none of these is rarely the answer. And if you're taking the SAT test or the ACT test, never guess that. In eight years of tutoring, I have never seen none of these to be the answer. Even though it was the answer on number one, certainly is not the answer on number six. Okay. How about number seven? Would it be D? Yeah, it's an infinite discontinuity, which is what you get when you have vertical asymptotes. In other words, if, if I graph D, I have a vertical asymptote at minus 2. Well, a vertical asymptote is an infinite discontinuity. Virtually always, whenever you have a vertical asymptote, you have an infinite discontinuity. How do I find the limit of that as x goes to infinity? What's the horizontal asymptote? Oh, I don't really know how to put it into words. Well, it's the ratio. When you're figuring out horizontal asymptotes and the degree in the numerator is the same as the degree in the denominator, they're both one, then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of their coefficients. So y equals 2 is the horizontal asymptote. And what horizontal asymptote means is what the function goes as x goes to infinity. So y equals 2 is the answer, or b. In other words, you don't care about the 6 and you don't care about the 3. You might, in other words, if I could factor that out, if I factor I get an x minus 3. If I had gotten an x plus 3, it would be a different story. But I cannot do anything with x minus 3 over x plus 3. So I have to go back to the beginning and examine what the horizontal asymptote is from those two terms. It's 2. That's the answer. B. Hmm. Which of the following is not a function? Hold on. Well, the first, one, the first one looks like this. Is that a function? Yep. Second one looks like this. The parabola moved up 8. 
that a function? Yep. Third one. Notice the uniqueness about the third one. It's y squared equals x. That's not a function. That's, you're right. It's something that looks like this. In other words, it's a horizontal parabola because it's y squared equals x, and everything we're used to is y equal x squared, right? Well, the difference yeah. between y equal x squared, that's <coughs> a vertical parabola, which is a function, and y squared equals x is always a horizontal parabola. It might open to the right, it might open to the left, but either way, it does not pass the vertical line test. So that is not a function. And another way to figure that out, incidentally, is if we solve for y, if we have y squared equal 8x, what's y equal to? Uh, square root of 8x. Well, that would actually be a function. But it's not that. It's plus or minus square root of 8x. Well, square root of the plus side of square root of 8x looks like that. The minus side of square root of 8x looks like that. Well, that so not, really does not pass the vertical line test. But it's that's something that's important to know. In other words, when you have a plus or minus like this, that's the plus. That's the minus. Together, they don't have, they don't form a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. It's basically a composite of two different functions. All right, let's look at 10. These are easy, believe it or not. What's the first term? Uh, it'd just be uh, negative 1. Plug in 0 for n, and that gives you your first term. Wait, so it's not 1? No. So it'd be just... Look it over eight. here. n goes from 0 to 80, not 1 to 80. So the very first term is where you plug in 0 for n. So just be negative 3 then? Correct. What's the second term when n equals 1? Negative 2. One I mean negative 1. Negative one. Negative one. Exactly. And then the third term is when n equals 2 and you have positive. So one. Right. But that's how you yeah. do those infinite or those series is just it's very important to look at where n starts because a lot of these n does start at 1. But some of them n starts at 0. And some of them n starts at 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. If I had the series 1 over natural log of x or n, excuse me, where would I have to start? Uh, n equals 1. Yeah. There's no way I could start at n equals 0 because the natural log of 0 is not defined. So I would have to start this series at 1, and even that's problematic. What's the problem with that? What's the natural log of 1? Natural log of 1 is... Uh... Zero. Zero, no. which means we're dividing by zero. So I could not even start at one. I would have to start at two. So the only way this series would make sense is if I started at two. So you have to start your series where it's defined. 
In other words, if I start at n equal 1, it's not defined. If I start at n equals 0, it's not defined. But if I start at n equal 2, then I have a real number. Now we get into calculus. Oh. Which is the following is the slope of the normal line at that point? Well, how are we going to get the slope? Um, Let's, get the the power. Slope. Let's get the slope of this line first before we even think about getting the slope of the normal line. I forgot the name of it, but it's where you like take the power to like... Well, so the first derivative is slope. That's what first derivative means. Okay? So if yeah. I want the first derivative, apply the power rule, what do you get? Uh, you get x squared. No, you get 3x squared. Oh, yeah, my bad. 3x squared plus x. Plus 1. Yeah. In other yeah, words, here, here, let's talk about the first derivative. Because, you know, I know you're going to take calculus next year. You're going to have to do all of this. But you start with the exponent, multiply it, and subtract 1. So 3x subtract 1. That's the power rule. Over here, with this term, well, if I start with the exponent, it's a 1. It's 1 times x to the 0. Well, anything to the 0 is 1, so that becomes 1. And the derivative of that is 0. So y prime, which is the slope of that line, is this. And they want you to evaluate it at 0, comma, minus 5. So what's the slope at this point? Mm. Plug in the x-coordinate for x. What do you get? Just 1. That's the slope. No matter what this function looks like, Notice they haven't drawn it or anything. But if we look at the slope of the tangent line at x equals 0, it's 1. They didn't ask for the slope of the tangent line. They asked for the slope of the normal line. Well, if we know the slope is 1, what's the slope of the normal? Wait, what? Sorry, I kind of just spaced out there. If the slope of the line is 1, what's the slope of the normal line? Negative 1? Yes. That's the answer. B. <laughs> so, the thing to understand from this is that that's what first derivative means. And it, it takes a long time sometimes for calculus students to get that. The sooner you get it, the better. That's what first derivative means, is it's the slope at whatever x-coordinate you're given. The x-coordinate we're given is 0. Well, we can take the first derivative using the power rule, and then we just plug in 0 to figure out what the slope is at that point. Mm -hmm. So the slope is 1, and the slope of the perpendicular is always the negative reciprocal. So that's the slope of the perpendicular. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa. How can I combine these, or what's normally called compress this? On oh, the monitor turned off for some. Okay, sorry. Turn it into one log function. That's always the secret: is to compress it. 
uh, you, know what I mean? log... you know what I mean when I say compress or expand? Yeah, it'd be log base 2 for x for if you compressed it. And now, how do we solve that? Uh, Convert it to exponential. Uh, yeah, so it'd be 2 fifths equals 4x. 2 to the fifth power equals 4x. And then you divide your answer by 4. Well, hold on. What's 2 to the fifth power, first of all? Uh, here, let me check. One thing that's really good to know in math is powers of 2. If you're going to memorize anything, memorize your powers of 2 at least up to the 6th or 7th power. Okay. 2 to the 5th is 32. Yeah, sorry, my, my phone isn't really working right now. Well, there's your answer, x equal 8. Okay. And then we check to make sure we don't violate any domain restrictions. Part of the problem when you're solving logarithmic equations is to make sure you do not violate the original domain constraints. In other words, had we come up with a negative number for x, well, clearly that's violated, the first part of that. You cannot have a negative number. You can't even have zero. So we better come up with a positive number for x, and c is the answer. But um, a lot of times you'll come up with two answers. One will be positive, one will be negative. And when you plug both back into the original equation, you see that the domain is violated, and you cannot use a negative x here. we will undoubtedly run into a problem like that. So let's keep going. This is one of the most common questions you can have in calculus. What's the slope of the tangent line? Well, what is the first? The slope of the tangent line means first derivative. That's what they're talking about. So would it be 2x plus 3? Okay, and then evaluate that at that point. Yeah, so you plug it in, it would be 1. So it would be b. Right. So the slope of the tangent line is 1. In other words, that's really an easy problem. So all you do is use the power rule to get the first derivative, and then you plug in the x value into the first derivative, and that gives you the slope. Now, this is a little harder. They want the equation of the tangent line. Well, if my function is this, to come up with the equation of the tangent line, most important part of any equation is slope. So what's the slope? Uh, Use the power rule. x squared oh. plus 2. No, no, no. 3x plus 3x squared plus 2. Yeah. When you're using the power rule, always start with the exponent. Like that. That's the first thing I'm writing. And then I'm going to subtract 1 from the exponent. Okay. Now here I can assume that's 1. I'm always going to start with 1 times 2. Subtract 1 from the exponent. It becomes x to the 0, which is 1. So this is the answer for the first derivative. Now evaluate that at 2 comma 12. In other words, what is y prime of 2? 14. That's the slope. Okay. Now, when you're in calculus, 
it's not generally efficient to use the slope intercept format. You'll notice that when you're talking straight lines, you have a few different formats to use. That's slope intercept. But the one that we generally want to use in calculus is point slope. Notice the difference. They're both equations of a line, but point slope works a lot better when you have a slope and a point. Well, what was our slope? 12. I think it was 14. Yeah, my bad, 14. It was 3x squared, 12 plus 2, yeah. So we know this much. Y minus Y sub 1 equals 14 times X minus X sub 1. Evaluate that at the point 2 comma 12. Plug in. In other words, it's called point slope for a reason. If you have a point and a slope, this is the best format to use. Okay. Okay, well, my slope is 14. What's my point? Um, do you just plug in 2? For x? And you plug in yeah, 12? Think... Not for x, but for x sub 1. In other words, here's my point. Right there. So I get y minus 12 equals 14 times x minus 2, and that's my final answer. I do not have to put it in slope-intercept format. That's a perfectly good answer, and in fact, with calculus, that's the best answer. And you'll notice that that's on there. It better be. And that's got to be D, doesn't it? Yeah. In other words, none of their answers are in slope-intercept format. And the reason is, is that we didn't use this format to come up with the answer. We used point-slope format to come up with the answer. And the reason was, is that we had a slope and we had a point. So whenever you have exactly that, you have a point and a slope, Use the point-slope format. It's always going to be one step easier, at least. Maybe two or three steps easier. So memorize this point-slope format. Not the same as slope-intercept, but with calculus, it's more valuable. Because with calculus, you usually have a point and a slope. That's the standard stuff you're given. So the point-slope format is better. Okay. All right. Here we have f of x is equal to 4 times the fourth root of x to the fifth. Well, the first thing you learn from calculus is that radical signs are never good, right? Redefine that function using an exponent instead of a radical sign. Uh, 4x to the 5 fourths. Yeah. Now notice that it's really easy. We can use the power rule. You can't use the power rule as long as it's got a radical sign. But once you've converted that radical sign to an exponent, now the power rule is great. What do you get when you use the power rule? Uh, 5x to the 1 fourth. Exactly. And if you must put it back into radical format, which I don't know why you would have to, but if you have to, then it's 5 times the fourth root of x. And let's see, what did this ask for? Just the derivative. So 5 times the 4th root of x. Notice the answers were all in radical format. 
And so that's be pretty frequent. In other words, when they give you a problem with a radical in it, they usually are going to have the answer with a radical in it. Even though you can't solve it in radical format, you have to convert it to exponential, then solve it, and then put it back in a radical form. Know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. Uh, number 16. What would it be? Because it's like one, so how would it fit into any, either of those? Well, if we're approaching from the right side, first of all, it's... We don't need to graph it because this is relatively easy. You can just do a direct substitution. When you substitute 1 for x, what do you get? Uh, 3. All right. Well, that's, that's correct. That's the correct answer. But maybe we need to look at it a little bit more. If I plot the top function, I get that. Okay. And let me erase this part. Is that not the top function? Yeah, it is. And if I plot the bottom function, Whenever x is less than 1, I get 5x. Well, that's a rather steep function that is kind of like this. A zero there and a closed circle there. And then I don't really need that line there. So I've graphed that piecewise function. Now let's look at it. They're saying, what is the limit as we approach 1 from the right side? Uh, 1. No, 2. Wait, no, 3. My bad. 3. In other words, approaching it from the right side, we're using this function. And that function goes to 3 when x is greater than 1. Now, the only thing I did wrong here was I put a closed dot there, which is not right. It's an open dot. Like that. So the function is actually not defined at 1. Because I got two open dots, right? In other words, neither one of these says greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. So when x is 1, it's not actually defined. But that doesn't mean the limit is not defined. In other words, the limit as I approach 1 from the right side, well, I hop on that function, start approaching it from the right side. What y value am I approaching? 3. I approached it from the left side, what would I approach? Like five. So therefore, what's the limit at x equal one? Uh, three, or does not exist? Does not exist. If the limit from the left is not exactly the same as the limit from the right, then it does not exist. If they're the same, that's the limit, regardless of anything else you see. In other words, if I have a function that looks like this, this value is 2, and this value is 3, what's the limit of this function as I approach 4 from the left? Uh, 2. What is it as I approach 4 from the right? 2. That's the limit at 4. It is not 3. 
In other words, f of 4 may be equal to 3, which is a true statement, but the limit of f as x approaches 4 is actually 2. And that's because from the left it's 2 and from the right it's 2. That means its limit is 2. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time it ever exists, if the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right. Seventeen is a little different. Whenever you're figuring out limits, think factoring as the very first step. And we want the limit of this as we approach 2. So I want the limit as x approaches 2. Well, notice that if we do direct substitution, what do we get? Uh, you get 0 divided by 0. Ah, that's the key. Whenever you see 0 divided by 0, that means you have to do more to the function. Is there any way to simplify that? Uh, x plus 2, x minus 2. Ah, and that does a lot. Because now we can cancel out the x minus 2s. And our function becomes x plus 2. What's the limit of that as x goes to 2? That would be um, 4. Correct. In other words, always substitute if you can. And b is the answer here. Number 18. What's the limit of that as we approach 2? Zero? No. There's a huge div difference between dividing into 0 and dividing by 0. If I say what's the limit of x divided by 7 as x goes to 0, well, that's clearly 0. You'd have 0 divided by 7, right? But if I said, what's the limit of 7 divided by x as x goes to 0? Well, now you have 7 divided by 0. Well, what's that number? Um, it does not exist. I guess it's an imaginary number. Well, it's not an imaginary number, but it does not exist for sure. It's basically infinity. But depending if we approach zero from the left it's negative infinity if we approach zero from the right it's positive infinity since they are not the same it does not exist in other words the very first thing you have to have for a limit to exist is that the limit from the left has to be the same as the limit from the right okay well, whenever you divide by zero, you're basically looking at infinity, unless it's zero over zero. If it's zero divided by zero, it's called indeterminate, and you have to do more work to figure out what it is. But if ever you have a number divided by, if you have zero divided by a number, that's always zero. But if you have a number divided by zero, that's basically infinity. You see why? Yeah. You know, if x, let's say I had 17 over x and x kept getting smaller, this keeps getting bigger. Well, as x goes to zero, it goes to infinity. So... That's the first thing to understand, is that there's a huge difference between dividing into zero or dividing by zero. And by huge, I mean huge. Here's zero on the number line. Infinity is way out here. 
So they're about as far apart as you can get. Mm -hmm. So they're not even close to being the same. Now, the only reason, eh, let's talk about this a little bit more. If I said this, what's the limit of this as x goes to 0? Well, first of all, as x goes to 0 from the right, what's the answer? Uh, negative infinity? Positive. Oh. Everything's positive. If I'm approaching zero from the right, then I'm talking about positive numbers. Okay. Okay. What's the limit of y as I approach zero from the left? Uh, negative infinity. Ah, they're not the same. Negative infinity is not the same as positive infinity. In fact, that's as far apart as two numbers can get. So the limit at zero does not exist. Okay? okay. Now let's change it slightly. Let's make it 1 over x squared. Now what's the limit as I approach x from the right? Um. Wouldn't that still just mean positive infinity? Okay, now let's look at it as I approach x from the left. Positive infinity. Ah, they're both the same. That means this limit exists. In other words, if I said, what's the limit of this function as I approach zero? Well, as long as the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right, the limit does exist. And my answer would be infinity. You'll still have some teachers that want to call this does not exist because they don't like using the term infinity. But it definitely exists. In other words, if I graph this function, this is what it looks like. Well, you can see as we approach zero from the right, we're going to infinity. And as we approach zero from the left, we're going to infinity. So therefore, the, infun the function at zero is infinity. Mm -hmm. But even still, some schools don't like using that as an answer because it makes it seem like infinity is a number. And infinity is not a number. Infinity is a a number that grows without bound. That's its definition. Why some teachers are reluctant to use that as an answer, I'm not quite sure. But up until a certain grade, they hate using the answer infinity. They'd much rather say it does not exist. But the problem is, is that this does exist. And it exists because the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right. That's why it exists. Mm -hmm. And it is infinity. If it exists, the only answer is infinity. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's make sure we know where we left off. Uh, looks like we left off at 18. So, how many more do we have? Not that many. We got almost all of them, 19 through 21. Um, now, let me ask you, you had a session scheduled today at 5.30. Do you still want that session? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, I figured. Let me cancel it. I didn't want to cancel it until I talked to you. Sounds good, Jacob. I right, well, thank you. I will talk to you next time. Yeah. Bye-bye.